The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. I would like to welcome everybody who is now seeing both video and audio to the now broadcasting live 2020 Fox Reading Conference on Structured Literacy to reinforce the fact that we have the science to help and teach all children to read, spell, and write. Um, we will be joined today um, by Drs. Louisa Motes, Dr. Louise Spear Swirling, and Drs. Margie Gillis. They will be joining us remotely from their sequestered places in various places across North America. So I would like to thank the crew downstairs from the Center for Educational Media who has put in all this into place to allow this to happen. And I'd like to thank my crew here from the Center for Dyslexia um, who are both physically and remotely online. If you would like to rage tweet at me or my center, you can rage tweet it there. If you'd like to send us some kudos and congratulations, you can also tweet and Twitter us there as well. Um, our website is provided on this slide and you might want that because you can go there and get to the event um, sites page. There you can get a PDF of all of the handouts from the presenters today. So I'm gonna keep this moving along here and keep a track on my time. Um, we have the ability to provide this to you somewhat of a free charge um, because most of this is underwritten by a generous gift from Tom and Elizabeth Fox who um, have been lifelong supporters um, during their lifetimes of education and in particular of literacy. So this is being brought to you thanks to the philanthropy, the, the generous giving of these individuals and we thank them tremendously and we hope that their family are out there watching um, on the interwebs. We appreciate you and all that you do out there in the schools and your efforts too. We'd also like to thank that we're further underwriting this by the generous gift of our gold and silver sponsors who have stuck with us even when we went to virtual. We'd like to thank you for doing so um, because we realize that you are not able to be here in, in front of people and you're still supporting us in this virtual endeavor. Um, this is not fully endowed or underwritten at this point, so if you'd like to donate, um, you are welcome to do that. Um, if you watch this after the fact on the recording, we are not issuing continuing education because we cannot verify that you actually did attend and watch the conference. Um, your organization may allow you to do something like a paper or report. Alta will do something like that. Maybe Siri would do that. Don't know. That's up to you to decide. Um, we are glad that you're with us here today and watching us. So let's move into what we're here today. And what we're here today is to talk about structured literacy, which is in a scientifically uh, a based approach to teaching children how to read. And I want to ground us in this day with a clear understanding that reading is language. They are not different from one another. I'd also like to ground us on the idea that literacy is reading and writing. It is not reading comprehension. I would like to further ground us in an understanding of what language is at the most basic sense. Language is the ability to express our ideas and thoughts to others. It is also the ability to hear and to read the thoughts of others and put those into our heads and save those for later. We have both an oral language component and we also have a written language component. As we are born, we are born into a world of buzzes, beeps, and bops, and we start to process those. And our little statistical minds start to process those and learn the probability structure of spoken language. And we isolate those words, and we learn those words, and we connect meaning to those words, and we are able to syntactically structure words to express meaning. That is what we do as our biological endowment. We are born with that ability. That is our gift of our biology. Reading is an invention that humans have developed in the not so distant evolutionarily past. Our ability to receive language in the written form is called reading. And when we are able to decode those words, recognize them, extract that meaning, link that in with syntactic structure, we can comprehend it. 
Our ability to express ourselves in written language and save those ideas and express those through both space and time is writing. And literacy is in orange here. It is reading and writing. And if you can't spell, you're not going to be good at writing. Many of you know the simple view of reading who are joining us this morning, and our presenters will likely highlight this. The simple review, simply stated, says that our ability to comprehend written language is the product of our ability to actually recognize the printed words on the page and link that in with our ability to comprehend spoken language. So you will see that our receptive and our oral and written forms of language are needed to get to comprehend written language. This was beautifully illustrated in this graphic, this metaphor that Hollis Scarborough came up with. Hollis developed this by reviewing in the late 90s all the psycholinguistic data that would have been available at that time. From her analysis of the data, she suggested that what allowed a person to be a skilled reader, a fluent automatic reader, and a comprehender of written language was our language comprehension abilities of background knowledge, which is a knowledge source, our vocabulary knowledge, our language structures in our head, our verbal reasoning abilities to draw inferences, and our literacy knowledge. The bottom strands, as many of you are aware and will be highlighted by other speakers today, is our ability to hear the sound structure of language and to manipulate that sound structure our ability to decode the printed words on the page and to spell them as well, and our ability to recognize those words quickly and efficiently through a sight system when we get orthographic mapping in place. We become increasingly automatic on the bottom strands in Hollis's metaphor, and we become increasingly strategic on these strands as well. And it's the product of these strands becoming more automatic and more strategic and then coming together and weaving together, we get a tightly woven system that allows us to be skilled readers. So let's look at actual data. So last week I was at AIM Academy and those of you that saw that know that I started with an emotional appeal. But I am a research scientist and for this in the Center for Dyslexia, which is the study and treatment of dyslexia, I want to start off by showing casing what we know about literacy development from research that we are doing ongoing in a large sample of children. So we're looking at a population of kids, roughly 200,000 right now longitudinally um, in partnership with um, some schools across the, the country. This is a subsample of that population. And what you're going to see here is you're going to look at their beginning of year data coming in on those strands. Their foundational skills of letter knowledge as well as phonological awareness will be here in the orange bars. We also have their vocabulary right here. And this is receptive vocabulary with picture testing and naming. And we have comprehension here. And this is an oral comprehension measure using um, auditory presented information and their ability to answer simple questions by pointing at pictures oftentimes or just giving a verbal response to those. There's roughly 6,000 kids, a little bit more, coming from a little over 200 schools in this study or this sample from this larger study that we're looking at. And I have their fall benchmarks from universal screening and then I have, which is the beginning of the school year, and then I have the end of school data. You'll notice that these kids come in and we look at the percentage of the kids in this sample who are proficient in these different areas, you will notice that most of them, the vast majority, come into um, school proficient on this universal screener. You'll notice that there's fewer kids who are proficient in those foundational skills of phonological awareness and print knowledge of letter knowledge which is a little alarming if you think about that. But if you think about what a parent like myself is doing with, with my child, if I'm just a normal parent who doesn't know what I do, which is how to teach reading, um, I'm probably reading a lot to my kids, I'm probably hopefully talking a lot to my kids, and I'm hopefully developing those oral language skills which are our biological endowment. It's what we come in here with. You'll notice that as the course of the year goes, we don't help these kids. They're not making the gains they need to actually keep up. And we're starting to lose more kids in all of these strands of the reading rope. They didn't come into school from their context, from their homes, from their communities. As they went through schools, we're losing some of these kids, but not many of them at this point. You may know, and you may know that we care deeply at this center, as well as a lot of other people around the world, about different groups of individuals. And one way to think about different groups is to think about racial and ethnic background. So now what I've done is I want to show you the beginning of year data from three different groups of kids, Caucasians, African Americans in the United States, as well as Hispanic from the United States in these schools, the same 210 schools. 
You will notice that when they come in, there's far fewer Hispanic kids who are at proficient levels on those foundational reading skills. There's a little bit more who are proficient from African American communities and homes, and there's a little bit more than that from these Caucasian homes. Notice that there's far less discrepancy between these groups on vocabulary, an area that we often hear people talk about saying is a problem from these communities of color. You'll also notice that when we look at oral comprehension skills, there's not as big of a spread either. So uh, my question, and one of the questions that we're asking with these data is, what does school do to these foundational skills? School is supposed to be the great equalizer. We have control over that time with those kids, and we can help them if we deliver instruction that would be of value and benefit to all of them. You'll notice that there's what we call a crossover interaction. Those Caucasian kids are benefiting and staying even as a result of going through school in their schools and the work that they may be getting in their homes as well. But remember, they, they did differ when they came in from those homes. You'll see that African Americans are, have the biggest drop off here and Hispanics as well. What about vocabulary? When we look at this, you'll notice that we have pretty steep drop offs in one of these groups in particular, and that's the African Americans. A lot of the Hispanics are English language learners. None of the African Americans are. I don't include ELL because statistically it's confounded with my race and ethnicity in these models when we run them statistically. But you'll notice that those African American kids in school are losing ground. Ground that they didn't have to lose because they didn't come into school with that ground to make up. What about comprehension? Here again, we see steep drop-offs in our African-American students as they're going through school. They didn't come into school with these problems, but they're not getting the instruction they need to keep them up. You'll also notice that the other three groups are losing ground in comprehension as well. Now, Louisa is going to talk about in her presentation the work that was done by one of my mentors and that she did with him, Dr. Reed Lyon. And Reed would always talk about um, economic disadvantage and how that's often a big driver. And many of you may be thinking back there or even commenting on the live stream about what about economy, what about poverty. When we look at school data, we have free and reduced lunch. So we can use that as an indicator. And you will notice that at the beginning of year in kindergarten, kids who come in from more economically disadvantaged homes are not as strong in their foundational skills of phonological awareness and letter knowledge. You'll also notice that they're not as strong. Uh, but you'll notice that this isn't an issue so much with vocabulary nor with oral comprehension. These are, these are really found in those foundational skills. We can ask the same questions I just did of race and ethnicity, which is across the school year, what percentage of kids are showing proficiency at the end of the year? And you'll notice that they're not gaining ground, but they're not losing ground when we look at these kids from, these different, um, from the free and reduced lunch uh, sample here. And here again, you will see now this issue of vocabulary where both groups are going down, but those kids from economic disadvantage are going down steeper. There's far fewer of those who are proficient by the end of kindergarten. And fortunately, we don't see that same trend in comprehension. So there does seem to be something going on. As part of this longitudinal study, we are doing the proper statistical model, which would be hierarchical um, mixed effects modeling to growth model this and look at this. And we are finding effects at both the child level, which accounts for sizable amounts of the variance, and also the school level. Schools matter too. Why did I start with kindergarten? Because I was able to show you what the community fed into those schools and then what the schooling either did or didn't do to the advantage of those children. I want to show you what you often hear people like me say who come in here from a center like dyslexia, which is it's very difficult. And the research we've published now in the Journal of Learning Disabilities demonstrates statistically and mathematically with a large sample of kids, in fact, this sample with 8,000, to find our kids with dyslexia when far too many kids in our schools have compounding factors from just going through school and they struggle to read and spell, which is the primary behavioral characteristic of a second grade child with dyslexia. So I've got here for you different profiles based off the simple view. You could be a dyslexic struggler. You could have problems with reading or spelling, or both. You could be a comprehension problem, those specific comprehension deficits where you have a problem with, let's say, comprehension and reading comprehension or vocabulary. You could be a mixed type, which would be a mixture of those two things. I've got print deficits and I've got or I've got comprehension deficits. Or, and then we have at the bottom here, we have what's the total that are below benchmark on this universal screener. 
I've got their school classification from these 122 schools that we're looking at in this subsample. They're either got no identification, so they're sitting in tier one general education classrooms. They either have a dyslexia identification and they've been identified and they're receiving dyslexia specific intervention based on the state law that these schools were sampled from, or they're identified with a specific learning disability, which in the United States is flagged under IDEA. Or they have a both. They're identified with both characteristics of dyslexia and they're receiving a dyslexia specific intervention and they've got an SLD classification through IDEA. Let's look at these profiles across these four different types of identified students in these schools, about 122 of them. You'll see that 14% who are just sitting in our general education classroom on the universal screener screen as having behavioral characteristics of dyslexia. Only 8%, almost half as few, have a pure comprehension pattern on the universal screener. Yet 39% present with a mixed type of both comprehension-based problems and print skill problems. Sadly, those numbers that look so good when they came in on their proficiencies on the universal screeners look much different because now in our general education classrooms in tier one, 61% of these kids are below proficiency on some measure off of this universal screener. But I showed you those kindergarten data. They didn't come into these schools with this disadvantage. When we look at our dyslexic sample, you will see that the vast majority fit a mixed profile of 81%. When we look at our SLD population, because we often hear us research types say that the majority have a reading problem and or both math and written expression, and you will see that 92% flag is at risk on the universal screener. And 98% who have a mixture of both dyslexia identification and SLD present with a mixed type. The wake up call for all of us is the reading wars are over and need to be dead because it isn't just phonics and or vocabulary and background knowledge, it is both. And look at the numbers. They need both strands. They need structured literacy and they need to be directly taught that because our schools are not giving our kids what they need to thrive and survive in our 21st century. So with that, I'm gonna introduce a dear colleague and friend, um, Dr. Louisa Motes. Louisa has been a teacher, psychologist, researcher, graduate school faculty, a friend and a mentor to me, and an author of many books that have helped to shape me. Um, you are fortunate because in my training as a reading interventionist to work with individuals who struggle during my postdoctoral fellowship, um, I was fortunate enough to get to read um, the Reading Rockets piece that Louisa wrote so many years ago, um, Reading is Rocket Science. And um, I think that we're all fortunate to hear her talk about some of the things that she shared all those years ago and are still pressing and relevant today. Um, so I'm going to let the team here tell me when I can get off and we're going to switch over to Dr. Louisa Motes and um, Louisa, I apologize. I will give you five minutes sometime in the future. Well, greetings everybody across the country and across the world. I know we have some people logging in from uh, halfway around the world, which is what I guess one of the advantages of being sequestered as we are is that we can use this miraculous technology to talk with each other and learn together. <clears throat> I myself am in Sun Valley, Idaho under a lockdown. Um, <clears throat> and um, one of the things I've been doing <clears throat> is actually uh, revising the paper called Teaching Reading is Rocket Science that I wrote for the AFT 20 years ago. And uh, given the currency of some of these and the persistence of some of these same issues, on the complexity of teaching and the difficulty actually of, of our uh, being able to apply on a, on a wide scale, the best practices that will result in kids benefiting as much as possible from their early years in school. Um, <clears throat> they, they, these persistent issues have led the AFT and uh, the Center for Development and learning to uh, to support the uh, reissuing of um, a revised version of this paper. It will be out in the summer. So the theme of this talk, this beginning talk, is that teaching reading is a very complex activity. And one of the mistakes I think that we have made in many of the standards documents and so on over the last 
especially 10 years since the standard movement uh, reached ascendancy in the States, is that the, the teaching of reading, the teaching is how to read, is often treated as if it should be rather simple and straightforward, and that all we have to do is tell teachers about the major components of instruction, and we should be home free because the real challenge is getting them to comprehend complex text. Well, um, I want to disabuse everyone of that idea. And also these days, of course, the terms the science of reading is being used in policy papers and documents and online discussions and everything else. And I just want to reiterate for those of you who may be very young and, and who may not have followed this field for decades as I have, um, when I think of the science of reading, I think of a vast research literature that is multidisciplinary, um, that um, was uh, in large part in the United States funded by a coordinated program of research um, designed uh, mainly by Reed Lyon beginning in 1992, and that involved many university-based research centers across the country. You can see, however, that in my neck of the woods here in Idaho, nothing much has happened. We're sort of the great black hole here in the, in the mountain west, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> but those of you who live elsewhere, you probably have one of these major research centers uh, and, and the eminent faculty who have worked uh, on these grants for many years, you probably have a center near you. <clears throat> and in 1992, this is what the research team looked like. I was hovering in the back here um, as an uh, invited participant with these far more eminent researchers who are the individuals I admire most and who were my mentors um, and who have gone on to be, uh, to provide us with sort of the backbone of, of, of the, the research um, uh, f findings that uh, amount to uh, consensus ideas across the field. So we owe all these people uh, a great debt. Um, nevertheless, the reality out there, and I thank Carolyn Cowan, a colleague who is uh, a, a stalwart uh, supporter and, and contributor to the International Dyslexia Association's work, uh, she developed this cartoon showing the research to practice chasm that still persists in our field where um, reading scientists are on one side of the chasm, uh, reading educators are on the other side, each with uh, sort of um, uh, beefs about uh, who, who's causing this, this uh, lack of communication to persist. Um, but uh, given this reality, it is our, our mission as, as um, researchers to try to make the research not only accessible, but also translatable into classroom practice. So um, uh, one of the uh, striking um, aspects of, of this reality of the chasm between science and practice for me over the years, because I've had one foot in both fields kind of straddling the chasm for a long time, is that uh, I've become uh, or I became uh, several decades ago very interested in trying to document what teachers actually know. Um, so we can't just, we shouldn't just complain that they don't know enough, but we have to ask, why do all of us um, have to go about our work without sufficient understanding of both the content of what we're trying to teach and the basic tenets of, of the psychology of reading, meaning how kids learn to read and what kinds of um, uh, instruction are going and instructional activities are going to be most uh, effective for certain kinds of kids at certain points in reading development. So 
especially after I realized that in my own uh, training, uh, first to be licensed as a teacher uh, and in my training in the master's program I went to, and then subsequently for years after that, my own uh, preparation was uh, miserably inadequate. I started uh, when I became a faculty member to measure what it was the students in my classes came into the classes with. And that began a series of papers. The first uh, I wrote was just, just based on surveys of my students in 1994 called The Missing Foundation in Teacher Education. And I was really trying to stir the pot. And uh, after that, many of my more uh, credentialed colleagues who were better trained than I in experimental psychology and other aspects of research um, went ahead and actually carried on the research. Uh, Susan Brady, um, uh, the Snow, Griffin and Burns, uh, work on the knowledge to support the, the teaching of reading, um, all the people who contributed to special issues, the Journal of Learning Disabilities and Reading and Writing 10 years ago now, uh, all the people who contributed to the development of IDA's knowledge and practice standards for teachers of reading, uh, especially Louise Spear Swirling, who has generated a number of studies, again, on, on the students she's been working with, and she'll speak to some of that this afternoon. Um, there's a whole literature now on what teachers know, uh, what relationship there is between what teachers know and what they do, and how all of that factors into what students learn. So related to that literature on teacher knowledge has been um, a series of surveys uh, carried out um, primarily by the National Council of Teacher Quality that many of you may be aware of. They, they began in 2006, then did a larger study in 2013 surveying the, the courses in schools of education for their content and their rigor and their methodology, asking simply how many of these courses actually taught teachers the basics of the so-called five essential components of teaching reading. And um, as many of you may know, the findings were rather discouraging in that in 2013, um, the finding was that 29% of the programs that prepare teachers introduce teachers to the, the five, these five essential components named in scientific reviews. And that, that was rather discouraging. And 59% did not prepare teacher candidates to be effective instructors um, and addressed only uh, two or fewer of these essential components. So you had to ask, well, what in the heck are they teaching? Um, and the preparation of uh, teachers in the area of so-called struggling readers, meaning the hodgepodge of poor readers, undifferentiated, only 22% adequately addressed quote, strategies for struggling readers, let alone any in-depth understanding of what causes reading difficulties, what those subtypes are about that Tim mentioned in his introduction. Now, the good news is that in their most recent teacher prep review from uh, just this, this uh, beginning of this year, um, the trend is up. That is now, uh, approximately half of the programs that were surveyed actually address in their in their coursework these five essential components. This is again a very low bar, and we're not talking about any kind of sophisticated treatment of any of these components. It's just that teachers who come out of these programs will be acquainted with the content in these areas and the basic tenets of instruction. Um, whether it's high quality or not, at least they would have heard of these components and something about how to teach them. So we're, we're making a dent in the problem, but we have a long way to go. So 
we have to ask more, much more seriously why these gaps persist, why the gaps in teacher preparation, why the gaps in teacher knowledge, what are they all about? Because the underlying assumption that I and others make is that teachers cannot possibly be asked to teach effectively something that they themselves don't understand and haven't been uh, adequately schooled in uh, as professionals. So um, one, one of the findings in the literature is that those who are teaching the courses in the schools of ed um, may not be up to date on the research literature, may have had no incentive to dig into the research literature, may be um, uh, um, uh, supported in delivering coursework that, that simply doesn't address what we're talking about. So one of the major um, studies was published in Scientific Studies of Reading in 2012 um, on, on, uh, on what teacher educators tend to know and how that affects their students. Another really important document was generated by the Barksdale Reading Institute and the Institutions for Higher Learning in Mississippi prior to the Mississippi Reading Initiative, which now has been shown to be rather effective in moving the state forward. Um, but in the, um, in the study in, in scientific studies of reading by Emily Binks and colleagues, um, these data are very interesting. These are the specific questions that were on the survey of faculty. And then you can see how they were, how they correspond to what the students in the classes also showed that they knew on the same survey and the parallel is obvious. If the faculty member could answer the question, the students tended to be able to answer the question. But what's alarming here is uh, when you get down past um, simple phoneme matching, as in uh, the fact that chef and shoe begin with the same sound, recognizing a word with two closed syllables well, we're down to 65% in the faculty, 53% in, in their students. Correctly recognize the definition of phonological awareness, 58% of the faculty, 47% of the students. Identifying the number of morphemes in these words, heaven is one morpheme, 40% of the faculty, 21% of their students. The fact that observer has three morphemes, ob, serve, and er, 26% of the faculty. And what's so striking is the word frogs, which has two morphemes in one syllable, 29% of the faculty, 24% of the students, and then naming all five components of the NRP. Uh, we're not doing so well there. Uh, now, this was 2012, and I would hope that if this survey were given again, that the results might improve. But it does show, for example, why there's this stark difference between what we say in some standards, like the IDA standards about morphology and the importance of morphology in teaching advanced uh, word study and word recognition. Well, the teachers may not have any familiarity with what that component of language is about. Um, and in the Barksdale study, um, there was a series of, I think, 10 major findings in the report that they issued, which was kind of the basis for everything that followed in the state. But in that survey of one state, um, the, the result of the survey was that of the courses was that established research principles of literacy instruction remain largely unapplied in preparation and practice. And uh, finding number four was that balanced literacy as interpreted by Mississippi teacher preparation programs and in many K-3 classrooms has res resulted in widespread use of practices that are not supported by research. Now this was 2014 and to their credit, one of the remarkable shifts in the state of Mississippi has been the um, very widespread participation of higher ed faculty in Mississippi in a higher education initiative 
to um, bring everybody up to speed on the content and methodology of good uh, teacher preparation that's going to equip those teachers to be effective when they get their licenses. It's, it's really a fantastic uh, process that's going on there. So this is my favorite cartoon. We have lots of information technology. We just don't have any information. That is, we have all these structures in place for teacher preparation, but what we're actually teaching teachers is often lacking in, in content and is not aligned with research. So what's behind all this? It's certainly not an intention by anybody to do a bad job. It's certainly not um, intentional um, uh, mediocrity. I mean, everybody wants to be well prepared. They want to be, um, they want to send teachers out who will do a great job. Everybody recognizes that um, we have a huge challenge nationally to improve our rate of reading achievement, especially in high risk populations. So is this all about teaching experience? In other words, well, it's just, uh, you know, you, you can't really prepare anyone before they get in the classroom. Are they going to be much better at all this and do better on surveys once they get into the classroom? Is teaching experience enough to really give teachers insight into both the content that they should be teaching and the methodology that's going to be effective? And unfortunately, in these um, multiple studies of teachers, uh, mostly done by, by colleagues, not by me. Um, in study after study, teaching experience appears unrelated to or only somewhat related to knowledge of language structure or the processes of reading development. And this is something we find as we go out to work with teachers in the field. Many have been in, in practice maybe for 20 years, and we start teaching them um, very concrete ideas about language, language structure, how kids learn it. And it, there are these huge ahas. Oh, I never knew that. I never realized that. And then the, the delayed reaction is, why didn't anybody teach me these things before? I couldn't just learn them, you know, from the program I was using. I didn't learn them from the program. I needed someone to teach me this content before I got out here or earlier in my career. But this idea that experience is really the telling thing, you can see it reflected, for example, in the Readers and Writers Workshop claims. Um, the main claim to the efficacy of that approach is that it's based on thousands of hours of teaching experience by the authors. Not that it's supported by research, but that it is based on hours and hours of teaching experience as if that were the defining factor in the worthiness of a program or an approach or a set of concepts. So the disciplinary knowledge is not obvious, natural, or intuitive. And this is one of the striking things to me that is really one of the root causes uh, that, that perpetuates the gap between science and what we do in practice. Um, is that to get this uh, disciplinary knowledge under our belts, we really have to be taught it in a fairly structured setting in coursework. Uh, it can't be done quickly, simply with one course. That's not going to be enough because there's too much of it and it's too complex and it's not easy because of the way we're wired up. So, um, look at some of the evidence of this. Anne Cunningham at Berkeley has been a wonderful contributor to this literature on teacher knowledge. And one of her studies, in one of her studies, she asked um, <clears throat> a very large group of first grade teachers how they would prefer to teach reading. Okay, if you have the reading block, what are your, you know, what's, what's your favorite thing to do and how would you structure your time? And um, so she ended up concluding from those results, quote, that it appears that a philosophical orientation towards literature-based instruction, which is very prevalent in California and big districts, tends to be more exclusive of other instructional approaches. In other words, once the literature-based uh, meaning emphasis approach takes hold, uh, there, there comes with it a kind of psychological aversion 
to learning the more what's perceived as a more mechanistic um, set of instructional practices that have to do with the content of actually uh, how you how you read the words and teaching kids to actually read the words and all the specifics that go with that. Uh, so she stated teachers preferred practices don't conform to current research and policy recommendations for teaching first graders, which is quite a striking statement. <clears throat> and then Susan Brady and Margie Gillis worked with her on this study of, of um, uh, teacher professional development uh, with one of the grants they, they got uh, to, to study the effect of professional development on a group of first grade teachers. And the, these were quotes from, uh, from the, the study published uh, uh, from their work that first grade teachers' philosophical framework about reading instruction was germane to the extent that teachers learned the content of the direct methods of reading instruction. In other words, the, the preconception about what reading is about and how you do it, um, uh, a kind of schema that teachers come with, if that philosophical framework about instruction already is populated with ideas about how it's bad to take the sounds apart in words and uh, phonics is an impediment to, uh, to fluent reading for enjoyment and those sorts of things. The teachers then are more resistant to actually learning um, what that approach entails. So Susan said those with a whole language orientation or less responsive to professional development in phonology, phonics, and spelling, which again are very, re require a specific knowledge base to teach well. Um, and many other researchers, uh, too many for me to quote extensively here in the limited time I have, but <clears throat> they, they've also looked at the so what? Okay, what's the link between teacher knowledge and student outcomes? And um, some of the really good studies that have shown that there is a, 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 a correspondence between um, teacher knowledge teacher practice and student outcomes have been done by um, uh, Deborah McCutcheon at the University of Washington and her colleagues, um, Barbara Foreman and I, uh, as part of our NICHD work, published a paper about it. Uh, Joanne Carlisle and her colleagues have also uh, written about this. And uh, one, and, and then of course, Louise, um, Aaron Washburn, Emily Bings Cantrell, Malt Joshi, Shane Piasta, and Cunningham, and others, who really um, have have formed up this literature. Um, <clears throat> um, and one of the key findings over and over, and especially in Joanne Carlisle's work, is that <clears throat> one of the key elements to all of this. Uh, translating a uh, better, better, a better knowledge base into practice is the um, is the provision of coaching, and I'm really glad that both uh, Louise and uh, Margie Gillis will have an opportunity to elaborate on this idea later in our program today. Uh, but this is one of the graphs that that Susan Brady's study generated. That, that shows um, how, how these factors are at work. Um, they, they took the teachers that were rated as exemplary in their overall practices, those, that's the red line, and compared them to teachers who were less exemplary uh, on overall teaching competence as, as they were observed over the year and looked at the relationship between their scores on a phoneme awareness task and on their, their level of pro proficiency in, in teaching uh, explicitly, teach, being able to teach their kids explicitly. And again, this is a subtle thing that's operating kind of behind the scenes, but those teachers who already have better phoneme awareness themselves or who have learned and acquired phoneme awareness through the course of the, of the professional development are the ones who are more able to translate uh, into uh, explicit and systematic explicit instruction uh, their, their content knowledge. Very interesting finding. 
So what teachers know affects what they do. And uh, Ann Cunningham also has stated this, that teachers who performed well on phonics tasks tasks on her survey prefer spending more time on explicit and systematic instructional practices and less time on unstructured literature activities because they understand how to do it and they 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 have an affinity for the for the content it's really important so prior knowledge of language plays a role in teachers choice of instructional activities they, these findings, and, and they're similar to things that I've observed formally and inf informally, are what drives my campaign for taking time to teach teachers the structure of language as, as a priority in our um, approach to teacher professional development and, and preparation. Because, again, when teachers understand the content themselves, they're going to be more open to learning how to translate that into teaching kids. And they're going to be much more comfortable in uh, delivering uh, systematic, explicit instruction. Um, and, and then uh, there's always the question, well, can't you just accomplish this by giving teachers a good program? Um, and the answer is, well, no. Um, uh, I thought this was a marvelous study by Shane Piasta um, at the University of Ohio, who continues to generate very good studies. Um, but this was also in scientific studies of reading, uh, in which she looked at um, the, the fact that students' gains were, it, uh, on re in reading achievement, were predicted by the interaction between teacher knowledge and the amount of explicit decoding instruction that students received and highly scripted core curricula, she said, cannot replace the expert teaching of highly knowledgeable teachers um, and uh, came up with data showing that more code instruction, okay, you tell teachers that it's important to do systematic explicit code instruction with, by giving them a program, but if teachers had very low levels of the content uh, knowledge themselves, they couldn't produce gains with that program, even if the program was fairly well designed. So again, teachers can't be expected to get results with a program if they themselves don't know the content, why it's there, why it's important, what they're trying to get across to their students. So now um, uh, uh, let's shift gears for a second into this idea, which is that, okay, if we're, if, if some of these programs and, and in teacher preparation were not uh, giving teachers what they need to know, well, what are they being taught? And um, uh, one of the um, one of the kind of insidious uh, ideas that underlies a lot of what teachers are taught and what their programs tell them to do is that reading is primarily a visual skill and and primarily a visual memory skill. And you're probably saying, well, what? Of course, we use our eyes to read and we have to look at the print in order to read. And yet, what our research uh, has shown in, in many different ways is that, well, you need visual acuity, you need to be able to see the print in order to read, but the areas of the brain that are most involved in reading are in the language centers of the brain and the visual processing that's necessary to interpret print is um, uh, confined and actually built up as a very specialized kind of visual processing that is better called orthographic processing um, and the area of the brain that uh, underlies uh, orthographic processing is in, in a location in the back part of in the brain uh, and part of the occipital area. Um, Tim can give you a lecture on, on the brain, but my point is that if you look at psychological tests and how they correspond to the ability to read, um, they 
don't show much correspondence between generic visual processing activities as we measure them with certain kinds of cognitive tests and the ability to read. So some of the evidence that's right in front of us a lot of the time is that, for example, if you look at spelling and studies of kids' spelling problems, well, shorter words are not necessarily easier to spell than somewhat longer words. So there's something going on there. It's not just, uh, we're not just memorizing strings of letters, or if we did, spelling the words of and to and do would be easier than spelling a word like inform, which is not necessarily the case. So, and um, uh, if you give an intelligence test, for example, visual spatial skills are often quite strong in kids who have reading problems. And the correlation between generic visual spatial skills like block designs and puzzles, they're virtually unrelated to reading and spelling. I learned that when I was a, a psychologist giving the WISC to kids in a clinical setting um, for many years, and I used to observe this and I thought, well, this is curious. Then I looked in the manual and saw about a 0 0.09 correlation between block design ability and the ability to spell. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Somebody ought to be talking about this. Um, rote visual memorization drills are generally ineffective when we're trying to teach kids to read and spell. And language proficiencies have been since the 1970s shown to be the best predictors of both reading and spelling, and sometimes spelling even more than reading. And then when we look at the whole literature on how to teach, um, in general, structured language teaching is the most effective approach. So there's a lot of evidence that we should not be approaching uh, teaching reading and spelling as if they were rote visual memorization kinds of activities. And one of my clinical uh, tests um, uh, for this, or one of my, the, the uh, clinical evidence for this was uh, a young man I remember testing uh, who had terrible spelling problems. And he wrote this essay, Dear Michael, uh, today, this is a seventh grader with a full scale IQ of 110, which is a standard, which is um, 75th percentile. Today, I'm going to take a trip to Hawaii and I'm inviting you when we are there. We'll go sightseeing, take a swim, go boating, go in an airplane or helicopter, ride around the islands, and we'll kayak all the way home. Goodbye, your friend Daniel, his name was. So I, I, I said, well, uh, I always ask kids to draw a picture of a person because that's what we did as psychologists. And then we had fancy ways of interpreting that. Well, it struck me that this kid from a rural school in Vermont who had had absolutely no training in how to draw was self-taught, was able to draw a human figure with dynamic movement and shading and three dimensionality. It was really quite remarkable and was known to be kind of the, the school artist. Uh, but this had no relationship to the fact that he didn't know that the word ride was spelled R-I-D-E. Um, so um, a word configuration is not distinctive in any way when we learn to read. The shape of words is not distinctive in any way. And the way we learn to read the word shape is by decoding it uh, by phoneme grapheme correspondences, shape, and the symbols that represent those three sounds. Um, and context does not drive word recognition. These are all um, part, th th these are the non-structured language approaches that Louise is going to be talking more about later today that are so uh, pervasive in our classrooms, um, it is not helpful uh, to do this very widespread thing, which is to say, well, if you don't know that word, just keep on reading or take a peek at the pictures and see what could make sense here um, instead of trying to sound it out. So what's going on? When we know how to read a word, it seems as if we read it as 
um, a visual whole. Uh, and in our word form areas, we have, if we're proficient and automatic, we have stored the image of this word uh, so that we're able to recognize it instantaneously. In fact, if I flash that up there, if you know the word, you cannot prevent your brain from reading it. Uh, but what's going on is that um, your brain has recognized its linguistic properties. Um, it recognizes that it has three morphemes, a prefix, a base word, and um, a suffix. And that suffix has two syllables. So there are three morphemes, but four syllables in that word. It's recognized the phoneme grapheme correspondences. And in this case, there are two graphemes that have two letters, the EA representing E and the CH representing CH. And of course, to, to learn the graphemes, you have to uh, recognize the letters. So in reverse, what has happened as we've learned to read this word is that we've built up proficiencies at each of these levels of uh, linguistic awareness. And we have learned to understand uh, the letters and what they represent, but the letters and letter combinations as representations of phonemes. And we've then learned to parse a longer word into its syllables. And those syllables are not the same thing as the morphemes. Uh, but in recognizing these different levels of linguistic representation, we've been able to store that word as a, a, a uh, a whole word that is instantaneously recognizable. But we did not go from the whole word uh, originally to, to its um, stored image. We went um, through this uh, process of recognizing its linguistic elements in order to recognize it proficiently. So, uh, of course, uh, one of the key sources for our current understanding of what goes on in the brain and the networks that have to be constructed over time is from Stanislaus Dehaan's book, Reading in the Brain. And you can go on YouTube and look up a 20-minute lecture by Stanislaus Dehaan in which he explains in very understandable English what the brain is doing as it learns to read and how this visual word form area becomes populated with the images of words that we can recognize instantaneously. Um, a more abstract representation of what we need to do as we, as we learn to recognize words in terms of building up connections between certain processing systems, language processing systems in the brain has been in, um, in Mark Seidenberg's work since the 1980s or perhaps before, but everything he's written um, has contained a, a version of this graphic, which um, shows that we have a phonological processing system that must be educated, an orthographic processing system that must be educated, um, a, a, a lexicon or, or vocabulary, a meaning processing system that must be educated. And that word recognition takes place in the context of language use and the topic that we're reading about. Um, so to, to teach kids how to read, we ourselves must understand what these processing systems do and what it means to educate each of these processing systems, not only as a system on its own, but also in relation to all of these others. Um, so what does powerful professional development or, or uh, early preparation entail? It entails um, uh, framing what we're doing with scientifically sound models of how we learn uh, for starters. And those should be our reference points for everything that we do down the road. We should be able to justify what we're asking teachers to learn with reference to these models, such as the four-part processing system I just showed you. 
We also need comprehensive roadmaps for how to teach all of the essential components independent of whatever program we're using so that, as we like to say, teachers can be smarter than their programs. No program is uh, perfect. They all have gaps and we need to improve on all of them as it turns out. We also have to have a pretty good understanding of how the English language is structured at all the levels uh, by which it's represented in print. And we, we then need to learn uh, through modeling and practice how to deliver structured literacy lessons. Tim mentioned the reading rope. This is now ubiquitous in um, a lot of our, our, our professional development work and in um, I mean, it's all over the place. Thank you, Hollis Scarborough. Hollis Scarborough may not have realized when she jotted this down for her paper in 2001 that it would um, go viral and that it would be so useful for so many of us in conceptualizing what needs to go on in reading instruction. But what uh, I want to point out, which we point out a lot in our professional development work, is that each of these strands has integrity. In other words, we have ways of measuring the contribution to overall reading of each of these strands in the reading rope. Those involved with word recognition, those involved with primarily with language comprehension. And each of these strands is important to address because it makes an independent contribution to overall reading proficiency. So whenever we've lost our way, we might reorient ourselves to asking ourselves, well, wait, am I missing something in my instruction or is this program I'm using missing one of these strands? And if so, how can I supplement and what can I do to beef it up? Um, all right, so um, uh, what, then uh, should we be thinking about in order to prioritize instruction? Because another one of the subtleties here, another one of the aspects of uh, the complexity of teaching reading is that kids are not all the same. And I'm so glad that in Tim's introductory remarks, he pointed out the uh, subgroups that are evident in his data. And some kids have clear problems with word level reading and predictors of word level reading. Some kids have clear problems with language comprehension without the word level reading problems. Um, but there are many fewer than those with word level reading problems. And then he said that approximately 40% in his sample have problems across the board with both language comprehension and word recognition. So what do our teachers have to be prepared to do? They have to be prepared to look for specific subtypes and also be prepared for the fact that a big subgroup are going to have difficulties across the board, whether or not they are formally diagnosed with either dyslexia or developmental language disorder, the run of the mill struggling reader is going to have issues across the board. So they have to be able to use data to determine who needs uh, more work and what kind of work with phoneme awareness and phonological skills, who needs what kind of work with phonics De uh, and to decode and spell. <clears throat> and I would uh, add to that advanced phonics, meaning syllabification and morphology. Who needs more work building automaticity? You know, who has the basics but is not applying the basics in automatic word recognition and recall? Who needs bolstering of vocabulary? Who needs more work? Uh, in background knowledge uh, and bringing that to bear during reading. Who needs more work interpreting academic language, especially complex syntax? Who needs more work navigating different kinds of texts, um, uh, bringing metacognitive skills to bear in comprehension, monitoring and repairing miscomprehension if necessary? All of these aspects of reading uh, are going to be important for some kids um, at all at, at, at different stages of reading development. So therein lies 
uh, part of the complexity, this rocket science idea that it's not going to work to say that all kids need to be plugged into a certain program at tier two or tier three, tier three, uh, unless we can differentiate for um, the profile of the kids we're working with. And Louise has written a, a wonderful book, Louise Spear Swirling, on um, different profiles, and we'll be elaborating this idea later on. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, turn to one of my favorite topics here, which is, um, okay, back to phoneme awareness. Why is this hard? And why is it <laughs> still after decades of evidence? I mean, to me, when, when, I, when I use the term settled science, which now uh, people are arguing about uh, on the internet and so on, somebody just wrote a paper saying there isn't any settled science. Well, settled science is when the lead article in scientific studies of reading starts out with the statement, it is widely accepted that most, the vast majority of reading problems uh, are attributed to a core problem with phonological processing. Okay, that's to me settled science. Now it's not that scientists don't continue to unravel the details of that basic finding, but it is so robust that you, know, you don't even need to reference it anymore. However, the reality is that half of our teacher preparation programs are not even teaching teachers about it. So where's the disconnect? And one of the disconnects is that we aren't wired to be phonemically aware, and therefore it is um, easy to misunderstand what this is about. And where's the evidence for the misunderstanding? Well, many programs that you pick up will talk about um, a phoneme awareness in terms of phonics without distinguishing these two aspects of instruction. Uh, they will talk about phonemes as letter sounds. You see this in popular textbooks um, and uh, you'll see it all mixed up. So one way to straighten it out is, um, uh, and we do we do this when we work with the te teachers, you start out, okay, how many speech sounds do you think are in the word sing? And the response we get is, okay, there's one, or there's two, or there are three, or there are four. And when a, a group of licensed teachers sits in a room and cannot agree on how many phonemes there are in sing, then one can say, well, look, this isn't easy or obvious because not everybody who is teaching reading and sitting in this room agrees on how many phonemes there are. This is acquired knowledge. It is an acquired uh, uh, concept that this word with four letters in it represents three speech sounds in English. Sing. Um, it is acquired knowledge that the third phoneme in the word ax, a, k, s, is s, and that the letter K represents two phonemes in English. It's the only letter that represents two phonemes. Someone has to teach you that. Uh, I did not learn that true confessions until I was in my doctoral program, even though I had a master's degree and was a so-called consultant in neuropsychology, blah, blah, blah. No one had taught me formally what was what, and I was always a little fuzzy about these things. So it's understandable that we get data like, like this. And this was a study out of Vanderbilt. I, um, I admire the work that goes on there, that if you are in Tennessee, you have some outstanding uh, internationally known uh, researchers at Vanderbilt uh, who should be your, your uh, mentors. So uh, this article by Spencer Shuley et al compared the phoneme awareness of um, SLPs with the phoneme awareness of teachers. And one of the aspects of their study was uh, to compare the accuracy in uh, identifying the number of phonemes in these so-called hard words. And what I want you to notice is how terrible everybody is at this. 
especially on the teacher side, um, not being able to count in the word poison, p and uh, how many phonemes there are, or how many in quick, k u ik, or how many there are in box, b ox, or how many are in start, st art, um, or or the fact that in fuse there's a y in there that it is not in ooze or um, use or ooze and use are different. Use has a, a glide in it that ooze does not have. Again, this is formal knowledge that uh, we aren't born with. Uh, we, we process these words as undifferentiated wholes. And when people ask us to take them apart, um, it's, it's not an easy exercise unless we have been taught how to do it and taught what's what and the difference between spoken language and written language. So then, um, so we can document that it's, it's difficult and that just being a teacher of reading is not enough to learn what the phoneme inventories are or how to take words apart. Um, <clears throat> another aspect of the elusiveness of phonology as a topic is that phonemes are an abstraction. A phoneme is an abstraction. We, we say that a phoneme is the smallest speech bit or, or piece of, of spoken language that distinguishes word meanings. Okay, good. So we say there is something called the, the D sound, right? D. But when you say desk, and then you say dream, and then you say ladder, and then you say would you, uh, watch what your mouth is doing or watch what my mouth is doing when I say the so-called d sound. It is not shaped the same way. Desk, my, my, my mouth is smiley. Dream, my mouth is puckered up. Ladder, I've made a tongue flap for the d. And in would you, I've said what, what is an affricated form of d. So I've made these different gestures with my mouth. These are the... Um, uh, 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 ways that are, uh, articulate these different sounds, but they are not the same in terms of how I am forming that sound. This is one aspect of phonology that is underplayed and misunderstood. And that is that a speech sound uh, is more than a sound. It is a sound and something we do with our mouth, a gesture. And how do we know about what's coming out of our mouths? We can actually take uh, make spectrograms of, of the frequencies of the sounds that are coming out of our mouths. And if we compare uh, how the beginning sound of elephant, egg, and echo uh, looks on a spectrogram, and thank you, Ann Whitney, for, for providing me with these pictures, elephant, egg, and echo, um, the, the frequencies look different. Uh, they uh, sort of sequence of, of vibrations that come out of the mouth are different. And as it turns out, the so-called short E sound is, is purest in the word echo, where there's a little break uh, between the A eh sound and the voiceless stop consonant, k, which follows it, which is different from the elongated vowel in the beginning of egg uh, before G and the gl the, the the, the blended sounds that come from put, putting L together where these frequencies are, are sort of fused and overlap. So um, when we talk about teaching the speech sound inventory, um, uh, uh, we have to be very explicit with teachers. Uh, a vowel sound is not A, E, I, O, or U. It is one of these 18 sounds, e, e, sorry, e, 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 i, a, a, o, 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 u, and u, and oi, ow, er, ar, and or. And then you will say, if you know the Linda Mood Bell, you'll say, well, that's different. And I say, I don't care. It's fine. You do uh, that different arrangement if you want. Mine is based on uh, studies of spelling errors and what kids confuse, and we can talk about that more. But then if we're teaching phonics, 
um, we can we can uh, show that in relation to the identity of these vowels in English, the 18 vowel sounds in English plus schwa, which floats in the middle, um, we have different uh, uh, graphemes that represent each of these vowel sounds. And this becomes a very teachable array of information, just as we would lay out a multiplication table for kids and learn it bit by bit. This is the uh, uh, analogous uh, information about the spelling of vowels in English. This is the way the system works. And we have some vowels that have very fewer spellings as in short A, why do we teach short A first? It's very predictable in terms of sound symbol correspondence, the A and cat. And then the long vowels have more uh, spellings we need to teach them one at a time. So, um, uh, and we'll say more about that later, but uh, to learn these graphemes, we need to explicitly teach phoneme grapheme correspondence. Um, and the, the basis for learning the code is to be able to segment the phonemes and then learn how each of these graphemes maps onto the phonemes. I'll say more about this in my later presentation. Um, and this is not all there is teaching reading, of course. The higher strands of the reading rope uh, are always in play and must always be addressed. And one of the key ideas from reading science is that when we know a word really well for automatic retrieval and flexible use, we have uh, stored it in our mental dictionaries with a, a lot of information associated with it. And um, we, we've we taken our lead from Charles Perfetti's work on deep lexical quality and how important it is uh, to build concepts around words. Um, a lot of information associated with each word that we want a student to know well and use with flexibility and so when a, when a student knows a word well and when we've taught it in depth, we have addressed uh, many or most of these aspects of what there is to know about any given word. So our vocabulary instruction routines need to respect this principle from science that uh, it's more than matching a definition to learn a word well, you need to learn its pronunciation, look at its spelling. Um, we need to present kids with student-friendly definitions, s uh, use the word a lot in context, elaborate its meaning, talk about its connotations and denotations, and so forth. Um, uh, so if we were teaching flexible, we'd look at the spelling, look at the familiar uh, parts, point out that flex is a Latin uh, root, ibel is an adjective suffix, uh, use it in context, flexible material can bend easily without breaking, uh, say more about the word, use it several times, ask questions about the word's meaning to get the kids to respond, and then elicit word use because we know that, um, again, ba back to the principle of all of this is language, right? Oral language is the underpinning for reading and writing. We want kids to say the word, use the word in sentences. So fill in the blank. My schedule can be adjusted. I am what? And so forth. And then we want to, if we have uh, a lesson opportunity, to point out that there are many related word forms that use this root. Um, and then moving on to the other aspects of uh, l academic language use and comprehension. We can't do a whole uh, presentation on, on reading comprehension here because of limited time, but um, uh, the basic idea is that students need to process text both at a local level um, and at a, a macro level by relating what they read to their background knowledge and what they have in long-term memory in order to construct a mental model of the text. And uh, in order to do that, and there's a lot of emphasis on uh, the importance of background knowledge 
and its role in inference making and text comprehension. And Natalie Wexler has written a wonderful uh, book about that that everybody's reading now. And that's great. But what I, I want to be sure we don't forget is that still the vehicle for unraveling the meanings of text is being able to decipher what the words are saying and um, extract from the written text what the sentences mean and how the sentences are str strung together and how the words are used in the context of sentences, um, uh, what figurative language uh, is being used to convey um, uh, and some of the, um, uh, we have to interpret some of the formalities in ang academic language that we don't necessarily have to interpret in spoken language. Um, and especially if we have kids from, from backgrounds where they are not read to a lot or exposed to academic language, all of these things on the list constitute barriers to comprehension unless we teach them specifically uh, what's going on uh, in any given text. Um, uh, and so, um, for example, uh, in the word, if we're, we've taught the word flexible, well, when it comes to reading, uh, a student might might come to the sentence, we had no reason to think she was less flexible than her competitor. Well, why is that hard to interpret? It has a double negative. Um, uh, what, if, what if the sentence says the rigid metal bar was replaced by a more flexible one? Well, that's a passive voice construction. What about uh, in the last sentence, the firm footbed was adequate, although it would have been better constructed with more flexible material. Well, there we have a complex connector, although which conveys sense of reversal in that sentence. And plus we have a, a complex uh, set of auxiliary uh, uh, verbs in there. So all of this is a foreign language to a lot of kids and must they must get help interpreting. So I'm going to wind up here on time. I hope, get ready, Tim. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar with the IDA knowledge and practice standards, we have tried to put into that document very explicitly um, what it is that teachers should uh, learn during both their preparatory work and then on into professional development. Um, uh, we have many, Louise Spear Swirling uh, was a major contributor to that document, especially um, writing the blurbs in support of everything that we put in the document. And I just want to wind up by saying, yes, as Tim pointed out, the essence of this this complexity in teaching reading is that we are teaching language and all of its systems and all of its forms to kids. And that requires a very solid um, uh, uh, content uh, knowledge and preparation on the part of teachers. And it requires that we look for and use instructional programs that explicitly and deliberately teach kids all of these aspects of language and how they are represented, not only at the word level, but in text that kids are having to read and write. So what can an expert teacher do? And why is teaching reading rocket science? You have to be able to implement explicit, explicit teaching and monitor whether students are learning that it in itself is complex. We have to be able to explain why words are written the way they are from a, a variety of angles. We have to choose examples and give corrective feedback, and our programs aren't going to tell us how to do that. We have to lead students into the meanings in text through judicious questioning and anticipation of what it is they might have trouble with. We have to base instructional decisions on data and adapt lessons for different reading profiles. All this is a tall order, and for me, it has been a lifelong endeavor uh, to understand and uh, to understand piece by piece and try to, um, uh, and I, I enjoy sharing the journey with others. So um, 
here I am after all these years talking about this <laughs> all over again. And I want to thank you all for joining us today. I want to thank the teachers who are striving to understand more and improve their practice all the time, to all the leaders, including those in Tennessee, who are unafraid to confront bad ideas and ineffective practices and turn us in a more productive direction. And I want to thank MTSU and Tim Odegaard and all those who are leading the way in Tennessee and all the sponsors of the conference. Thank you very much. All right, so um, I'm gonna start kind of in the progression of the topics you covered. So one of the things that came up early on was um, two threads of questions from our audience out there in the world. Um, I think we're over 2,000 strong now, I think, and I really appreciate all of you for hanging in with us this morning. Um, we had this question in two variations across multiple people. What are the best ways for school districts to help close the gap about the science of reading for teachers? We can't close the achievement gap for our students until we close our own. Right. Right on. I know, right? <laughs> right on, right on, right on. <laughs> well, um, the way that, okay, let me use some examples. The way that, I'll come back to Mississippi, and also um, Arkansas is doing a great job. Tennessee is about to do a great job, I think. Been helping in Arkansas for a decade, so I'm happy to hear you think uh -huh. that we're doing a good job. Uh, I know it's your home state. It okay. Is. Love me some Arkansas. Um, uh, confront. It's it's kind of a, a top down and bottom up process, but what's worked is first of all, um, the leadership in the state or the district. Sometimes it happens at the school level. Mm -hmm committing to um, uh, putting off a decision about, well, what program are we going to buy? Yeah. And instead, committing to having everybody in a grade level team and hopefully, you know, a, a few grade level teams backing up and doing their homework by subscribing to a really good professional development program and taking the time to have teachers really study what I'm talking about and get comfortable with it. Um, and I am all for going slowly with that. Um, our approach um, in my group is to take a whole year before teachers are asked really to, um, I mean, they, they can experiment with implementation, but as far as a whole scale implementation where they're, okay, deciding to use a certain different program or a handbook or something like that is to do their own homework first on dig into the, the, the content, understand what these models are telling us, look at examples, um, try out some things without having to uh, change overnight everything that they do. Because I think what does not work, and I'm thinking of, um, uh, a parish in Louisiana that we worked with, uh, Rapide Parish in Louisiana, where the leadership in the district said, wait, we've decided the answer here is not adopting another program right now. It is yeah. helping teachers really <coughs> get a grip on what they're doing. So I would say take it slow, make a commitment, make a multi-year plan. What we like to see is three to five years of a plan. Um, and uh, um, what happens is, as, as people learn better how to think about this and what to do, the issues about what programs and, and, the, and, and the schedules and this and that, they sort of sort themselves out. They do. It's interesting yeah. to hear you say that. I've been doing some work down in Florida with the school district, as well as some work that we're starting up in the, Phil in, in, the, in the Philadelphia area. And I took a slightly different approach, but the same thing, which is um, there's this whole big push on the background knowledge, right? So, yeah. And I'm a cognitive scientist, so we can't comprehend if we don't have some foothold. And oftentimes what people will say is, is that when they hear you speak or me speak, that they always get something slightly different from time to time. And we can't comprehend and understand and even perceive the reality until we have core knowledge. 
And we understand that for our students now, right? So there's a big push right now, and educators can understand there. We often lack the ability to reason with analogy and make transfer to different situations. So what we think is good for our students, we often fail to realize that the same cognitive principles and understandings of how humans learn apply to us as adult learners a lot of the time. And we can't even understand and comprehend materials until we have a core knowledge to do it from a cognitive science standpoint. Yeah. So I know we, we come at it from similar, definitely similar ways. I know you write a lot in speech to print about, um, about the cognitive science that undergirds a lot of what you just shared. So um, that was, you know, it's fun because that was what we basically set up as our implementation plans um, in these districts that we're working to support. Um, so this relates to this. Um, many are required to teach materials dictated by school districts that may not align with the thoughts expressed here. Any practical suggestions? Which I think you just gave one very clear practical suggestion. Uh, any others? Well, I guess my answer would be the same. I mean, just um, changing the program without the rationale for changing the program is just going to make people mad and defensive <laughs> for all the reasons I cited before. Um, and I think um, the other speakers today will have a lot to say about that because um, they do a lot of practical work with districts that are deeply committed to what we consider to be um, uh, programs that are not well aligned with the research literature and that are not getting really good results. Yeah. Um, but you can't just sort of barrel in and say, well, this is all wrong-headed, you gotta change. It's because of all the things that I outlined before about um, how deeply ingrained certain philosophies are. Mm -hmm. um, so you, you, got, kind of, you have to approach it by examining why the whole mindset has to shift. Yeah, I, I would agree wholeheartedly on that. And I know that for those of you that are chomping at the bits, um, Dr. Spear Swirling will address what those practices look like and how they're different. And then Dr. Marge Gillis is gonna talk about some of the real implementation work that her um, not-for-profit organization, Literacy Howe, has been doing in schools in Connecticut and elsewhere. So that's what Louisa is, is referring to that you will see later in the day if you hang in with us here. Um, I'm looking at the time, because I'm gonna steal a little bit of time from our team's lunch, just a little bit. Um, so I can give that to Louisa here on the back end. Um, you know, I actually want to have a conversation with you about this because um, you heard some banter earlier if you were on before the live stream and we had a time to chat earlier. And one of the things that I shared was is that I, I think that sometimes when you hear people having kind of deep conversations about nuanced issues, you think that we haven't resolved core understandings and that maybe we're disagreeing with one another. Um, and I'm speaking to the audience now. So when you're following the research literature or you're hearing me speak in one context and maybe David Kilpatrick speak in another and maybe maybe Dr. Emily Ferris, who's on my team, talking about what resistance looks like in very sustained, hardcore dyslexia interventions at a national con conference and you think that she's disagreeing with somebody, we're, we may not be disagreeing as much as you may perceive us to be doing so. So um, this is almost like a conversation then. Would you teach phonological awareness before phonics or at the same time? Ah, uh, depends on what level you're talking about. That's exactly <laughs> the answer that I would have yeah. given. Developmentally, where are you at in expectations? Developmentally, where are you? Think about the reading rope image. In the beginning, those strands are totally separate, right? So if you're talking about uh, late preschool or be beginning kindergarten, yes, you have parallel strands. You're starting to develop phoneme awareness. You're also developing letter recognition and basic letter formation. And pretty soon these two strands come together, maybe, you know, a couple months into kindergarten, depending where your kids are. Then you're matching letters with speech sounds. But um, and and then it and then you're you're applying that to word recognition very gradually. Um, it depends on where you are. And uh, we also really like Dave Kilpatrick's framework in which he he emphasizes the distinction between uh, very early phonological skills, which you have to work on. Uh, to basic phoneme awareness and then on to advanced phoneme awareness. When you get to advanced phoneme awareness, especially, there's a documented 
reciprocal relationship between beefing up your uh, uh, phonemic uh, proficiency and accelerating your your automaticity and word recognition and spelling and those things are going on at the same time so we talk about in a good uh, code-based lesson you have a strand maybe for three to five minutes in which uh, there's a phon phoneme awareness warm-up and you're on into um, the concepts of, of uh, phoneme grapheme or uh, syllable concepts at the same time. So it depends entirely on where you are. Yeah, and also probably the pervasiveness of any kind of language-based learning difference a student might have and where the nexus of that might lie. Absolutely. Right. Um, so, um, because I do think that when people hear people give answers, they may think that we're not actually giving a similar answer, but a lot of it does. To give you guys a resource out there in the world, um, you, hopefully you found our website, which has the event webpage. So I just showed that earlier and it's been posted in the comments. On that website, there's a resource tab on the left. We have a, um, an ebook that is open access to you for free um, that's called Dyslexia with an RTI. And it, it's not just about dyslexia, it's about the emergent literacy skills that develop starting in pre-K and on. And in that, we have a developmental continuum that shows you and then links that into universal screeners and where you start to things, things drop off of those because oftentimes we're not needing to go past that for the majority of students in the sample. Um, the research side of this, um, which Luisa could speak to this too, is tricky for us to, to, to model because we start to get into places where majority of kids have mastered something, they see the proficiency, so we start to not be able to model things because we just don't have the numbers and the variability to model at that point. And as um, actually Ginny Wanzak, who was just doing a keynote here on this campus two weeks ago, pointed out, um, it's those pervasively poor responders and the ones that need the most sustained intervention that my team's been working with for over a decade to understand are the ones that we really still have to do a lot of work to understand what their needs are. And they in particular may be the ones that need that advanced phonological awareness work and, and also in the sound structure. And that's something that David Kilpatrick hypothesized and we've been looking at for over a decade with neuroimaging and other forms of behavioral measuring.